You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. It is, without a doubt, one of the most beautiful places in Canada. It's on all the lists you can see for yourself. But that's not the only list this place is on. The Magdalene Islands, or Ile de la Madeleine, are also on the list of places you have to see before they're gone forever. Little by little, or not so little, erosion is reclaiming the shore of the Magdalene Islands, and homes and businesses and leisure spaces are being lost or left simply too dangerous to occupy. But this isn't a story about the rising ocean or the inevitability of climate change or the hopelessness that can take over when you consider those things. No. This is a story about a beautiful place, about the people who love it, and about how they're going to save it, no matter what. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Harris Gresco is a writer based in Montreal. He has written for the New York Times, The Guardian, The New Yorker, and about the Magdalene Islands in Hakai Magazine. Hello, Terrace. Hello, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Can you take us to the Magdalene Islands? Like, where are they? How do you get there? Yeah, they're um, kind of this scribble of sand in the mouth of the uh, St. Lawrence River, in the Gulf of the St. Lawrence, located between the Gaspé Peninsula, so the easternmost point of Quebec, and Newfoundland. They're actually a little closer to Newfoundland than Quebec, even though they are technically part of the province of Quebec. To get there, you can take a car ferry from Surrey in uh, Prince Edward Island. It's about a five-hour trip. Or you can fly, as a lot of people do, from Montreal or Quebec City. And that's how I got there on a little twin propeller plane. But most people, I'd say, tourists arrive by plane these days. And so it is a little bit of a tourist spot, I guess. Can you describe it for us? Like, just give us a sense of the place. What's it like? It's more than a little bit of a tourist place. It's a, it's a huge tourist attraction, especially among Quebecers. So the population of the island is only of the archipelago. It's uh, 12 islands, six major ones that are connected by these causeways. Uh, the population is only 12,700, but if you can imagine, they get about 80,000 visitors a year. So basically, if you can imagine a small, small borough of Montreal or a small neighborhood in Toronto, that's the population of the islands. But they get about five to six times more visitors, and they're mostly concentrated in the summer months. So it's a place that's really well loved and for a bunch of good reasons. The geography is absolutely incredible. If you're familiar with sort of the uh, red uh, cliffs of Prince Edward Island, it's a similar landscape, but there are these gossamer-like um, barrier beaches, which are which enclose these kind of inter-island lagoons. So uh, the islands are kind of bathed in these con- in this constant wind, which makes them a really amazing place for kite surfers who come from around the world. And uh, yeah, it's, it becomes sort of this sort of playground in the summer for all, all people, especially from Quebec, but also some Europeans. So a gorgeous place, but with some very challenging geography. Right. And that brings me to why we're talking to you today. They're a lovely tourist destination. Why are they on lists of places that you must visit before they disappear? Yeah, Time Magazine listed it as one of its top 10 places to see before they disappear. And that is because of a couple of interlocked phenomena. One of them is the question of sea level rise. Uh, The other is the fact that islands are actually subsiding. Um, So the, the level is going down relative to the ocean. And that's not the case in sort of the mainland of Quebec or the mainland of Canada, where the the, the land is rebounding after the disappearance of the glaciers. The Magdalene Islands weren't affected by the the Laurentide Ice Shield, and that's one issue. The other issue is that storms are getting more frequent and more violent, and they're having a big effect on the coast there. It has a very fragile coastline. Beaches are all of these beautiful sort of uh, 
powdery quartz that squeaks underneath your feet. But these beaches are actually what's remains of the uh, the coastline that's being washed away by as I say, more frequent storms. You can actually see the coastline eroding um, in some places. When I visited, I talked to residents there who would show me videos of being on hikes along the coastline, and it's crumbling. If you go up to the side of the uh, cliffs, um, you can actually use a car key and just scrape them away. So it's very fragile. What is it about the storms that do so much damage? What kind of storms are we talking about here? So the first time I went to the islands, it was in 2019, and it was about a week or two after uh, Dorian, the big storm that hit the Atlantic coast of North America, one of the strongest storms to make landfall. And uh, by the time it reached uh, way up north to uh, the Magdalens, it had been downgraded from a Category 5, but it was still strong. And it really hit the uh, the coast of Magdalen Islands hard. So when I was around there, when I got there, there were buildings that had been completely destroyed by the winds. Uh, there were boats that were washed inland. They still have a strong fishing industry there. And the most dramatic thing, I think, is just the way that the roads and bicycle paths, even along the shore, had sort of disappeared into the, uh, into the ocean. So it's a place with not a lot of land. Um, and uh, not a lot of places for residents to go. So that's why it's like one of the places that's sort of become a poster child for uh, sea level rise. So what's happened to some of the community as the sea kind of rises and encroaches upon the land? Like what problems have they had so far? I'll give you a couple of examples. I mean, they're kind of dramatic. There is uh, one building called the uh, Edifice Circo, which is in sort of the downtown of the islands in a community called Capo Mu. And there's an A&W there, ex- except the A&W in this building is now closed because if you kept on going through the, the drive through after you'd collected your root beer, and mama burger you'd fall into the ocean <laughs> it's uh basically the the uh, the storms and uh, the encroaching seas have washed away the parking lot and the, the driveway behind the nw um, i went to a campground there and people were camping next to this sort of hole in the grass and i looked down the grass looked down through the hole and I mean, of course, there are fences around to prevent people from going in, but you could see a drop of about five or six meters and the waves rolling in beneath it. It's really incredible to see. So these things make for a really spectacular landscape. I was I went there and I I rented a bicycle and rode a 10 speed bike all around the island, exploring all of the nooks and crannies. And. It's, it's very tempting to get close, but you realize it's actually quite dangerous. Often you're like walking on, a, on an overhang. I, was, I went to some really spectacular cliffs, and it felt like I was sort of at land's end because on either side there was a plunge of dozens of meters down into the waves. And the, the, you could see the ground, these sort of fissures in the grass covered cliffs underneath your feet. It was, it was, it was remarkable. And as I said, I I'd just run into residents and they'd pull out their iPhones and show me images of cliffs crumbling uh, above them or below them as they were walking along the paths. So there's a number of ways to adapt. And the article I wrote in Hakai magazine that was republished in Walrus is deals with a variety of strategies both official and unofficial, the people there are taking to cope with the new reality. Let's talk about those strategies, and maybe we'll start with the unofficial one that painted such an image in your piece. Can you tell me, you know, what was one of the first things they tried? I guess they were trying to save a dune. Can you explain that? I was interested in the sort of the soft methods um, that they're using, because the, the whole attraction of the Magdalene Island, the Les Îles de la Madeleine, is their natural beauty. They have these about 300 kilometers of sandy beaches. Um, They have some sort of historical communities, you know, that have buildings, old sort of um, uh, salting sheds um, that have been turned into tourist attractions. Uh, A variety of natural and human-made landscapes, and they're trying to preserve them all. One of the ways they're trying to deal with saving the natural landscapes like dunes for example um it's just by building up the dunes and one simple way of doing that is they're taking lobster traps now there's a big lobster fishing industry there and 
strangely enough, because of climate change, it's uh, gotten even better for them. A lot of lobsters, because of changing water temperatures, have migrated north from the Gulf of Maine. And uh, they're having these bumper crops of lobsters. So they have a lot of extra lobster traps. And they're taking used or uh, no longer functional lobster traps made of wood, stripping them of all their plastic stuff, and then laying them down in the dunes in lines and then dumping sand over them and the sand naturally accumulates on the lobster traps creating an additional layer of protection now this is very useful in protecting as i say natural landscapes there's another method that they've embarked on and that's called shorefront armoring where they lay down gravel and rocks there's a thing called riprap which is sort of small and medium-sized rocks. But a lot of this stuff has to be imported from outside the islands because the islands don't have a lot of rocks of their own. It's a very sandy environment. So they're being barged over from Newfoundland. And the results are getting mixed reviews. A lot of the people on the island fear, islands fear that the results are going to be ugly because they're basically building a wall of rock around some of these communities and areas where they have a lot of heritage buildings. And frankly, it's ugly. And the reason that the people come to the Magdalen Islands is for this sort of incredible feeling of untouched natural beauty. So the big question is, will the, the Magdalen Islanders continue with the soft approach where they're protecting dunes and trying to work with the changing tides, the, the, the changing storms, or whether they're going to uh, opt for an approach that's becoming much more popular around the world and the shorefront armoring. Right. And that's something that several big cities have begun doing, right? So it's it's an established practice. But in town, I guess, as you talk to these folks, how do they weigh those choices? And, and what's that discussion like in terms of should we do this and armor our community or does that ruin it? Like, I imagine that must be quite a debate. It is. I, w I went to a public meeting at a local community center and there was a lot of concern. One thing, though, I don't think there's any questioning on the Magdalene Islands that this is happening, that this is a big concern. I mean, back in 2004, they, they introduced a buffer zone, one of the first communities in Quebec, perhaps Canada, to, to do that, where they said there's no new construction allowed close to the shorefront. Uh, I forget how many meters. It's a couple of dozen meters from the shore. And, you know, that's a great idea. But there are a lot of houses that are really close to the shore. So the people at the public meeting I attended were mostly interested in the details. What would the what would their cherished communities look like after they trucked in all of these rocks? And in a lot of cases, they, they were concerned about the the appearance of it, having more informal conversations with people, they were like, well, you know, the reality is we might have to move. Uh, I talked to one guy who does this great comic book called Nessifer, who's kind of like the asterisk of, uh, or, or Tantin of, uh, of the Magdalene Islands. And he's got a shop in one of the most vulnerable areas. He lost $10,000 worth of graphic novels when the waters rose after uh, Dorian. And he's saying to himself, you know what? I love this place. I love the fact that tourists come to this little area where my shop is, but I'm, I might have to move. And a lot of people are saying that. Interestingly enough, though, I was kind of curious about the psychology of the people who were just like sticking in, staying in place. So I talked to a lot of people who were just like had these houses or cottages next to the shore. I wanted to find out what the hell they were going to say. There's one couple, two, two women, one in her 70s, I think, and one in her... Uh, early 60s, they were a couple, and they had a place that was really within, you know, 20 feet of a rapidly eroding shore. They, they, they're kind of famous for having pictures of their houses taken by Quebec media outlets, because it is quite dramatic. So they'd spent tens of thousands of dollars of bringing in big boulders to protect their property. But when I talked to them, they'd also done tons of work on their house. So they built this really solid concrete basement and they said they could go into the basement to when there were storms and to kind of ride out the storms a lot of people on the islands have these double windows that are very storm resistant uh, they won't break during storms um, 
So this is a form of sort of domestic armoring, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> against the coming storms. And I was thinking about it. You know, the woman was saying, well, you know, I'm not going to be alive for much, that much longer. I'm in my 70s, and this is where I, I have a beautiful view, and uh, this is where I want to uh, you know, spend the, the final years of my life. And I could kind of see that. There's a famous place in British Columbia, called, I think it's called the Wiccan Ninish Inn, where people go to view storms. I, so I, could, I was interested by the psychology of it. I mean, the logical reaction, of course, and what the administrators on the island, the municipal politicians are trying to do is to encourage people not to build near the shore or to retreat. Which in the long run, is probably the most sensible uh, approach. And it's not just houses, of course. There's like sewage treatment centers. There's a hospital. The, the city hall is uh, very close to rapidly eroding cliffs. So it's a huge issue. And all of them uh, face uncertain futures, especially if the big fear is realized, and that is um, a major melt of Antarctica, which is the wild card in all this. The, the ice atop Greenland and atop the Antarctica really seriously start to melt thanks to some kind of feedback loop in the atmosphere or an rising ocean temperatures, that's where we're going to see a big problem for cities around the world. For the bigger cities that are really stepping this up and armoring their shorelines, it makes sense to continue to do absolutely everything you can and to just, you know, coat your city in walls of rock to keep this out. For smaller communities like this archipelago, at what point does it does it become easier to pack up and leave? Like, it's one thing to talk about moving houses, but you're mentioning, like, moving sewage plants, moving hospitals to a place where you may have to move them again. Like, there is a tipping point here where this is no longer viable, right? Yeah. Um, well, the, the advantage that the Magdalen Islands have, you know, it was settled by um, Acadian people um, after the Acadian expulsion of 1755. And there's a lot of history there. There's a lot of love from the west of, west of Quebec. And the I think last year, the Magellan Islands got about a third of the entire climate change adaptation budget of the entire province of Quebec for a community of 12,700. And there is room to adapt and there is time to adapt. So that is possible. The question is, you know, whether you'll actually ruin the, the charm and the attraction of these places. I think, as you say, a lot of the big, when there is serious real estate involved on the New Jersey shore in most of England, most of the shores of England are now armored. Most of Japan, there is hardly a natural beach left in Japan. Those places are going to continue to armor. There is a problem with armoring, though, and it's important in the Magdalen Island context because when you armor a part of the shore, that is when you put up rocks and you know barriers, it just re redirects the energy of the waves to somewhere else. So if you're defending a place like New Jersey Shore or the Miami area, you might want to do that because so many people come to those beaches and love that area. But you have to be conscious of the fact that you're just shifting the problem somewhere else and other natural beaches and shorelines are going to be affected by the energy of the waves that are redirected from the, the hardened part. And armoring is really going to destroy what people come from all over to, to enjoy the, the, the fragile beauty of, of these islands. Which is why you see it now before it's gone. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy that I saw them when I did. And uh, although I, asked my, I have to ask myself, you know, are we part of the problem? Are we loving these islands to death? They um, they already have trouble dealing with all the tourists coming in. And you have to ask yourself, in getting there and visiting these islands, am I contributing to the problem? I took an airplane to get there. People who take uh, boats also bringing their cars, that kind of thing. You're obviously contributing to... to uh, to climate change your emissions when you go there. So it's, uh, it, for me, it's kind of a, a fraught place. I guess, there, I guess there is kind of a disaster tourism mentality where people might be inclined to go to, to check these places out before they do disappear. Um, I hope not. <laughs> Teres, thank you so much for this. It's fascinating. Yeah, a real pleasure. Thank you, Jordan. Teres Gresco, writing in Hakai Magazine. That was The Big Story. For more from us, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. Listen, it's going to be the weekend. You have plenty of time to take our listener survey. There's a big button at the top that says survey. You can click that. Spend about five or ten minutes. 
giving us your thoughts, your opinions, your criticisms, whatever you want. We'll be most appreciative you might even win a tote bag. What a life. You can find this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. It doesn't matter. It'll be there. You can ask your smart speaker for it by saying, play the Big Story podcast. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. Have a safe weekend, and we'll talk Monday.